Yeah, I was just trying to make a, uh, I don't know if it's a metaphysical point, but it's an annoying point that, <laughs> yeah. that unless you record that you've made the announcement, then no one will know if you've made it or not. Oh, okay. So we're in a loop. I'm recording the meeting. Okay, <laughs> there we go. And it's on record. And Chris Mitchell is the um, national expert on community broadband networks from the Institute of Local Self-Reliance. And Chris runs the uh, the website muninetworks.org and he keeps his fingers on the pulse of pretty much every community network in this country and we are honored to have him on our advisory board thank you very much Chris yeah happy to be here it's good, it's okay. good to see how it actually works out yeah so um, without now that the further ado has has gone a little too far let me turn it over to Chris, and uh, Chris, where Chris is going to give us an overview of how community networks, you know, the range of things that community networks do in uh, in this country, and then do a deep dive on Wilson, North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. And if he doesn't do that, I'm sure it'll be interesting anyway. <laughs> so Chris, please take about uh, 10 or 15 minutes and um, I'll cut you off if you go too long, but uh, please uh, take us into the topic of how other communities do it. Sure. Um... We were tracking more than 200 citywide networks, um, of which, um, um, sorry, um, of which uh, most of those are fiber to the home networks, but there's still about 60 communities that have uh, citywide cable networks. Uh, those are slowly being upgraded to fiber to the home networks often. And uh, there's another about 400 cities that have some level of wired municipal fiber, uh, whether that's a dark fiber along a transportation corridor or a more substantial uh, links that, that connect business district or something like that. But uh, about 400 where we see some smaller part of town connected and more than 200 where we see every address is able to be served more or less by um, municipal uh, network. Uh, there's also networks we don't track, which are um, internal fiber networks that cities might use for school districts for internal purposes where they do not make any available um, and you don't make the fiber available um, to the to businesses or the public. Um, and I think it might be useful to just sort of step back and say that this kind of started in the 70s, I, I guess I would say, with like cities that were building their own cable television networks, because they'd either been bypassed by the private sector, or the private sector built out a network and then found that eh, it was just too hard to do. And so they kind of abandoned it or sold it to the city. In the early 90s, in Glasgow, Kentucky, um, they were um, very forward thinking and they took uh, cable connectors and they threw them onto um, cards that plugged into a bus and the computer and figured out how to talk across the network and started figuring out how to move um, bits around at about two megabits a second or so on, um, on the cable network that they had that was owned by the community in Glasgow, Kentucky. So we call that the birth of community broadband, uh, the first place. Um, I think arguably they were the first place years later to then have broadband available to every address in the city uh, through that, that cable network. Uh, over the years, the number of, of the networks, um, the, the cities that had their cable networks added that broadband capacity to it and others just started adding uh, fiber or HFC, hybrid fiber and coax uh, to uh, their networks in order to deliver broadband and cable services and, and voice services. And around about 2000, we start seeing cities experimenting with fiber and this includes public utility districts in Washington, which are probably the first to be building uh, fiber to the home networks uh, on a significant scale. Um, and uh, particularly using the open access business model where they 
because of state law in Washington, they were not permitted to offer retail services. So uh, they're doing that in um, Reading, Pennsylvania, not Reading, Cookstown, Pennsylvania, uh, builds a, a citywide network. Bristol, Virginia does. Those are kind of the earliest ones. A lot of them claim to be the first. And so who knows, but like they were all pretty early and working out a lot of the kinks. And, um, and so we have um, kind of that model moving forward with mostly municipal electric utilities that are operating cable networks and offering broadband as a part of that and ultimately then telephone services as well in what we would call the triple play and it's something that a few cities get into that aren't municipal electric utilities but it's more or less something that municipal electric utilities do more of. And then over time, as we go through the 2000s, we see you know, fiber prices dropping a bit more. We see more cities doing it. That's um, when uh, Chattanooga gets into it in 2009 is, is the, sort of the canonical example that people will point to. It is an outlier in terms of its success. Um, it's captured you know, two thirds of the market. It has 100,000, 120,000 subscribers, um, which is by far the largest municipal uh, broadband network. And um, we start to see around this time thinking about, oh, do we need to offer television services? And um, television services are just very difficult. They're extremely um, painful to manage. Um, you have to get into contract disputes with all these companies that don't even want to answer your phone call because they don't really care about you. They want to sell to um, Comcast or other systems that have hundreds of thousands or millions of subscribers. They don't want to sell to someone that has 3,000 or 5,000 subscribers. Uh, and so um, a lot of the cities that are operating networks are viewing television as more and more of a headache. It's something you can barely make any margin on. Generally, it's where most of your complaints are coming from. And so there's a question of like, well, would it be viable to build a network and only offer broadband? Um, Longmont, Colorado basically says, yes, we think it is. And in 2015, um, they've launched, they've largely built out and, and it looks like it's pretty successful to offer a gigabit and I think maybe some telephone services through a partner. But I think that's sort of where we see other cities that don't have municipal electrics start to get in a little bit more because building a data network is uh, less intimidating for a city in many cases than trying to build a triple play network where you're trying to deal with the regulations and the, the difficult um, circumstances around offering video channels. So um, at that point, I think we, we start seeing more partnerships. We start seeing cities that um, are, are trying to figure out like, should we do this or not? Like city of Seattle, city of San Francisco, none of the large cities have yet really done anything ambitious on it. So this is still the province, mostly of cities that are in the order of 10 to 25,000, you know, kind of rural population centers that have been passed over. But a few outliers like Wilson, North Carolina has, has, well, has 50,000 people. Uh, Lafayette, Louisiana is a high profile network with 120,000 people. Chattanooga serving the area that it's allowed to serve is about 250, 350,000 people, I think. Um, so that's more or less how it's developed. Um, you know, I didn't say anything about Muni Wireless. Um, I think in some ways the trend around uh, the Wi-Fi networks in the, in the 2000s is it's a whole different track. People who wanna attack municipal networks will bring it up, but really what happened there was there was a business model that you bought um, you know, hundreds of access points to put in city streets and try to deliver services to the homes. And that business model was a bad one. And so cities that tried to do it did not do well. Private companies that tried to do it did not do well. And generally that track just was um, more or less a failure for what it was aiming to do in terms of providing a third pipe to the home. But that sometimes comes up for people who want to say, oh, municipal networks fail. So regularly look at Philadelphia, look at, um, I don't know, any number of other cities that have tried, that had tried to do that. But that was just a simple fact that it was a bad technology choice for what they were trying to do. And it really didn't matter if it were a public or a private entity, it just didn't work out. So for the wired networks, we treat them as being somewhat separate. Um, so way these networks tend to be funded is um, the citywide networks tend to be funded on the order of uh, private 
um, investors investing in municipal bonds, uh, sometimes from the city, um, probably more often from the electric utility. And uh, there's no taxpayer dollars that are used in the course of this. Uh, the city borrows money by issuing bonds and repays the bonds often over 20 years with revenue from the system. Uh, there's some examples where this has gone poorly. Um, Ashland, Oregon and Utopia, Provo um, are our networks out west that we commonly um, point to when talking about this, where they made some bad decisions, had some bad management, and had to use taxpayer dollars to cover losses for some period of time uh, in order to try to deal with um, their higher costs than expected and lower revenues. Um, although in the case of Utopia, they've gone, I think now eight years, maybe more, uh, without um, uh, needing any sort of operating subsidy and all the new debt that they've issued in that time has been paid for out of their revenues. It's just the debt that they issued initially where they've made a number of bad management decisions that continues to um, require taxpayer subsidy. Um, so one of the, the things I like to point out is that these things have a time element. Uh, municipal broadband is a multi-decadal investment. And so something can actually look really bad for seven or eight years. And then after year 15, it can look really great. And um, when you're talking about whether something's a failure or a success, I think in both cases, it's worth remembering that things can change depending on decisions that are made and, and that sort of a thing. Chris, we've seen that actually with OpenCape. OpenCape initially um, hired a um, provider to sell services to people and OpenCape would, would own the infrastructure. Um, and that provider called CapeNet kind of underperformed and eventually Open Cape uh, took over operations themselves. It was growing pains, but 10 years later, Open Cape is very successful, growing from its own revenues and uh, et cetera. So, so, yeah, we've seen it right here. Yes. And the other thing that you've seen is also the confusion in um, even among intelligent people who are confused why OpenCape is not delivering them service today to their doorstep. <laughs> and so one of the things that's always useful is being very clear about expectations because OpenCape is one of many projects that were funded in the, uh, the broadband stimulus as part of the Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 in which uh, middle mile networks were built and politicians and others were talking about how great it was. They were gonna think there's 120,000 homes or 200,000 homes in the service territory of this middle mile network. Um, but there was no plan to connect those homes. <laughs> it was just sort of um, hype. And many of us were watching, like we were watching a train wreck as we understood what was happening and people were getting their hopes up. Um, but as we've seen in Open Cape, Mass Broadband 123, um, in any number of these middle mile networks, you might get some investment to connect homes from the private sector because there's a robust middle mile network, but it's rare. And generally you need additional funding. That's what Massachusetts found out out West. And that's why they put a whole bunch more money into the hill towns to um, actually connect the homes there after they had um, put all the money in for the, the middle mile. Um, so uh, let me just talk about Wilson quick and then we can just you know bounce around with whatever questions people have. But uh, Wilson was one of the earlier networks. Um, one of the things I, I always remember uh, about them is that uh, they were very frustrated with Time Warner Cable. And uh, a salient point was that they, they wanted, um, people could not use uh, the internet to sign up for things like uh, the, and this is in around 2005 timeframe. Um, they couldn't sign up for like softball leagues or get their kids in the, the little league and stuff like that when it rained because uh, basically the whole town's network would more or less shut down when it rained um, because Time Warner Cable had so poorly maintained their network. Uh, the cable prices kept going up and Wilson's a town that had been reliant on tobacco and manufacturing. And uh, none, of, none of those things are, were a good thing to be reliant on in the 21st century. And so they were struggling and wanted to figure out how to reinvent themselves uh, ultimately decide through their municipal electric utility to build a fiber to the home network. And that actually so enrages Time Warner Cable that Time Warner Cable leads a multi-year effort in North Carolina then to make it illegal for anyone else 
to build the municipal broadband network. And that's been the law ever since 2011. Um, and uh, there's actually a really good documentary about this if you're into that. Uh, it's a 22 minute documentary called Do Not Pass Go. And actually, if you, uh, if you want, you can find it easily on fiberfilmfestival.com, which is a site we created just to highlight some longer videos that talk about uh, municipal fiber projects, but fiberfilmfestival.com. Um, modeled in part, David, on, on the, the work that you had done with your film festival or that Lafayette had done and you highlighted with the work that you did um, around um, the, the event that highlighted some of the videos that people had produced about municipal fiber. Oh, interesting. So uh, Wilson Beauty, builds a network. Taking notes. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think like, this idea of like having people like, you know, doing a, a sound off of like, hey, like, like, what do you think about your current broadband situation? Or how do you feel about your bills? And just see if you can find some gems um, as people record like one minute testimonials into their YouTube, um, into their, uh, their phones. Um, so Wilson builds this network, um, and they're immediately accused of, of failure. Um, you know, they build a network that costs, uh, see, it's 50,000 people. I think it was on the order of $35 million. They'd already had some fiber assets, and municipal electric utilities often can build at a slightly lower cost because they already have intimate knowledge of the poles. They have bucket trucks. They have crews. It's easier for them to hire people because of that, those decades of experience and in infrastructure. So it, it strikes me that I think they hired, they had something, borrowed something like $35 million. And um, what happens in the first several years of building a network is that you spend $35 million <laughs> and you have practically no revenues <laughs> because you have to spend almost all of that money in order to then sell people stuff. And so in year two and year three, you know, you signed up maybe a few hundred people, maybe even a few thousand people, but your revenues are still like a tiny pittance compared to the $35 million that you spent. And so the, uh, the press is like all these questions about, oh, is Greenlight a disaster? Like what's going on? They've lost so much money. Their budgets are so in the red. And this is all very predictable. In fact, you can look at the business model and say, this is what we forecast. <laughs> like year three <laughs> is supposed to be a bloodbath. Um, but nonetheless, when you have dishonest um, um, messengers that are attacking the network, they make a big deal out of it. And people start to feel like maybe Wilson's not going to be that successful. And I, I say that because it's really worth recognizing that dynamic and being ahead on it. Uh, but, but Wilson built the network. Um, they are a town that is a higher poverty than many of the municipal networks. And they have really responded to that in terms of uh, programs. They have three separate programs aimed at getting low income folks um, connected. Uh, they're, um, they're the first town in, in the state that had a gigabit. Um, they have brought in mul all kinds of new jobs. The network has never missed a debt payment. It's paid all of its bills. It is scheduled to pay off its debt actually in the next few years, um, a little bit earlier than, than was projected and required. Uh, it's been it's been a remarkable success, and uh, we love it because um, of of just how it's really been embraced by the community, how it's really seen itself as being a a part of the community. Um, and so I think it's just worth noting those three programs. One's focused on public housing. Uh, one is focused on um, on uh, people who could only pay about ten dollars a month. And um, they, they have a kind of a, a very slow connection that they will make um, available for families that are in that situation that will allow them to do some basic things. And um, it's, it's something that they do um, because they don't want those people to have nothing, but at the same time, they're sensitive to the fact that it's not broadband really. It's kind of more like a lifeline service. And then the third one is something that I wish we had more of, which is a pay ahead service, which deals with families that may have money, but to have poor credit. And often in America, it's difficult to get uh, cable broadband if you have very bad credit because um, they uh, view you as a risk. There's so many people who have run up bills and then not paid them that uh, the cable companies often do some kind of credit check. So in Wilson, they allow you to pay ahead. And this is a really good way of dealing with past balances. If you had previously ended your service with a large amount due or even a small amount due, you go in, you maybe give them $40 and you say, you know, you work with them and they say, we're going to take $10 from the $40 and we're going to, and we're going to take that off your, your amount that was due previously. And then we're going to put $30 into your pay ahead plan. 
And in those cases, you can actually even select the days basically in which you're paying about a buck 15 a day for, for uh, I think it's like 20 or 40 megabit symmetrical um, access to your home. And it's something that, um, you know, it's not something that a majority of people would ever want to use, but it allows them to deal with some of the economic realities of making this business pencil out, particularly in an area with such poverty. So um, there's a lot of really good things that they've done, uh, almost entirely without any federal support. They've applied for grants. They've generally not received them, um, but they've gone out of their way to try to make sure that everyone can benefit from the network. And like I said, they've had people moving in from, or, um, uh, well, they've had businesses moving in is what I said. They've also had people that are moving there from nearby areas or who set up a business office there because they need to go there during the week to run their business from there because Eastern North Carolina has quite crummy broadband, um, much worse than, than you have it. Although I know that the, the situation on the Cape is, is quite worse than most areas, but um, that's more or less the situation. I can ramble more about it, but I'd love to see if there's any questions and I was trying to highlight the things that I think are most relevant for uh, this project. Chris, thanks very much. We've got a really full schedule. Oh, okay. So um, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the other speakers on our agenda and we can come back at the end and have a discussion when we consider all of the things that we've heard. But this was really great. Uh, I expected just this much from you and, and you delivered as usual. Thanks great. very Thank much. Um, our next speaker is Dennis Pappas, who is the, I think, executive director is your official title. I'm not quite sure. Let me... <laughs> It's just director, but I, I appreciate the promotion on the call. So sure. Well, I called, a, a, I called our representative a senator on an earlier call this <laughs> week, and they liked that too. So, uh, but um, uh, Dennis used to work for the big bad cable company, and his job was to stop these awful municipal networks. So, and then. Uh, uh, Longmont, Colorado Municipal Network hired him. And so he's seen both sides <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to what he has to say. Dennis, uh, we've allocated about 10 minutes for you to tell your story. I know it's not enough, but um, we've got a, a lot of good speakers. So if you can tell your story. I'll do that. Yeah, I was with um, I was with CenturyLink for 39 years, and one of my uh, roles while I was there at one time was with public policy, and we fought the Utopia Network, we fought the Longmont Network. Um, <clears throat> spent a lot of time in front of uh, different PRCs, arguing the the evils of doing this and the, the you know the, the downfall of the public private partnerships. So um, I was lucky enough to. Uh, <clears throat> to be asked to vacate the premises uh, a couple of years ago. And about a year and a half ago, um, Valerie Dodd, who's the executive director, um, asked me to come to Longmont and help her continue with the build out of the network here. So I wish I could take uh, credit uh, for the success of the Longmont network. Um, it's, it was successful before I arrived. And I'm hoping that with what we're doing that uh, we're, we're helping it be more successful in the future. So. Um, in 2015 is really when we started building the network out. And Chris, you touched on it, right? It's that year three, oh my God, what are we doing here thing, you know, where we spent like $28 million on the, uh, on the build. Um, in all toll, with all the finance and the bonds and stuff, we are in it to probably about $58 million worth. Um, we have a 15-year note on the loans. Um, they pay off in 2029. Um, we are um, cash positive right now. Um, as I take a look here at the balance sheet, where you know we pay the we do the debt servicing, we pay all of our operating expenses, our opex, um, our capital bills, and then everything else that we got from just an O and M standpoint. And we're still probably to the good we were last year, about four hundred thousand um, dollars. We really start spinning off some pretty good cash then in 2023, 24, and 25. Where probably between two and four million dollars a year will be spinning off in, in 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 cash there because we've uh, we've really built out the network. Um, we are going to start offering a ten gig service here probably the end of third quarter twenty twenty one. Ten gig uh, symmetrical. It's ten meg symmetrical or ten gig symmetrical. Yes, and we provide one gig symmetrical today to the home. To the home. Yes. 
Amazing. Um, and so we, uh, Fort Collins isn't far away from this connection. They're, they're doing a network there. They've been offering 10 gig for, I think, a couple, about three or four months. And I believe they have one customer that's a day trader. So we're hoping really to get, um, we really didn't focus much on business before I arrived here. Um, in a short time, we've amassed about 1,200 business customers. Uh, we have uh, total customers right now at about 20, I think we're about 23.2. Um, our goal for the end of the year is at 24,000. And with the way we've uh, ramped up uh, on our sales and the marketing piece, of, we're probably going to end the year at about 24.8. Uh, so we'll be about 40%, really 48% over what the projection was for our growth this year. Um, we have uh, everything Sorry, along Dennis. Line. Yes, yes. Would you mind would you mind saying what that is overall in terms of your take rate as a percentage sure. of all the, of the whole market? Sure. Um, we had a total premises that we uh, we had in Longmont was about 45,000. Uh, we fiber and have enabled about 90% of that, about 41,500. Uh, our current take rate is around 58%. Um, part of the flaw with the initial design in phases, we built six phases. Um, phases one and phase six, we kind of built around the city this way. Uh, phase one and phase six are kind of the old architecture. Um, the plan is in the next three years to go in and rebuild a lot of that. Um, but we have, a, we, with all the annexation that's taken place in, uh, in Longmont, and which is Boulder County, uh, we probably have another 3,500 MDUs that are going to turn up this in the next 12 months. Um, Single family has dropped off a lot just because of the cost, the affordability piece, but uh, we have a ton of apartments and a lot of new businesses that are coming in, uh, big businesses. We just had Costco announced they're, uh, they're moving into a, a land there that we're going to serve or developing another phase. Phase seven uh, is going to kick off. Uh, we set the building in late July, and we hope to have, like I said, the 10 gig offering out of phase seven, then out of phase one and six, because those are our biggest uh, business uh, hubs that we have today. Um, we still have, like I said, we're about 90% built out. There really wasn't any number that said, when you hit this magic number, you can consider yourself totally built out. We've set 94% for that goal. We think we'll be at 94% built out sometime next year, probably second quarter next year. And at that point, we really want to take a look at expanding, kind of nudging west out of our territory into some smaller communities, hygiene and, um, and lions. Uh, you probably heard of lions. They got flooded during the, you know, the big flood and stuff. Uh, we really want to take, an op you know, take the opportunity to try to expand up into those areas uh, while we continue to provide you know, service uh, in our areas. Uh, a really small operations team. I have six technicians, uh, actually seven technicians now. I have two fiber technicians. I have six, uh, what I'll call the technical service reps, knock techs. Um, we don't have a knock yet, but with the 10 gig offering, it, it's very apparent we're gonna have to turn a, a knock up. And we're currently putting together a plan that, um, that will allow us to do that hopefully this year. Um, you touched on that and the PC Magazine just came out with their ratings. Um, I don't know if you saw that or not, Longmont is uh, number three in the nation for speeds. Um, we, uh, we, we've, we've had a little bit of a, I think a, a, a slide, a backslide with the total, um, with the speeds that we've uh, been able to provide. Um, but I have, I have a feeling that has to, more to do with how we're measuring the speed and the, the pops that it's having to go through to measure it than anything. Um, Who's so one and two, know, just out of curiosity. What's that? Who's one and two out of curiosity? You know, I, I really, I didn't really pay much attention to that. <laughs> okay. But PC Magazine has a new- It's Empire. Article. Okay. Empire what? is one, Google Fiber, Nextlight, Ting, Hotwire, EV. I'll yeah. throw a link in the chat with a breakdown of who it is. Oh, okay. Yep. Cool. And so that's kind of the, uh, the, the next light story. As I said, we're, you know, we're, uh, we're doing good. We, we still bring on about 40, about, we average about 47 customers a week still. And we've been built out for now years. Um, you did talk briefly about the, you know, TV offering. Uh, we did a TV offering. Um, it, uh, it, it failed um, as someone anticipated that it would. 
we're now well, working that was, with sorry that was like that was a third party layer three yeah it was called layer three right layer three correct yeah yeah so it wasn't like you built your own head end no no well I, i've been in the head end business also and that's with the uh with the increased uh, programming uh, cost it's never a win-win for the for the company so we are uh, starting a trial um, in July with uh, um, Streamwise, it's called. They're a cord cutter. They uh, provide a, um, a free service once you do the installation free service where they just provide a digital antenna and um, you do over the air and then you do all your streaming services based on whichever um, you know internet carrier that you have, uh, you have your service with. So. Uh, we're going to do a six month trial on that and see if that will allow some of the older generation like myself, you know, that are, you know, are afraid of letting the Comcast and the Dish and Directs go uh, to see if that will prompt them to do that. Uh, you know, we're hearing some pretty astounding numbers, you know, in first quarter, there were 2 million people that cut the cord and, and decided to do it else, you know, to, to do it elsewhere. And when we took a kind of a survey of the team that we had internally, about 80% are basically, uh, you know, have no Comcast or direct, they just do all streaming services. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see what the results of that trial are, we're looking forward to it. Um, one of the other things that we have going right now is St. Vrain Valley School D District is the fifth largest school district in the state of Colorado. And they came to us um, looking to provide services to their students that are on the free and reduced lunch program. And there are some pockets that are um, in town that have exclusive marketing agreements. So the management companies get door fees for a Comcast being in there and stuff. We're going to, uh, uh, we're going to put out a bid on an RFP for an LTE network. And uh, they're going to buy uh, jet packs for the students. And we're going to see if we can provide um, a service. It'd be 50 meg, a 50 meg type of a service, 50 and 10. Uh, to those students uh, at a free at a free uh, subscription rate, we have a fourteen ninety five rate. That's a you know income qualified rate. Uh, the rate we get right now is sixty nine ninety five. Uh, if you were the kind of one of the first ones to ride the light, you know, to steal the phrase from Quest, um, you know, we you were in for a forty nine ninety five. Our lowest level of service we were at twenty five twenty five about three months ago. We've upped that to one hundred and hundred. And basically, Lowest the level rate, of service 100 100. Yeah, yeah. For how and, much? And, a month? and the rate on the 100 100 is 30, 39.95. Wow. So the, the hopes are, and I've, uh, I've talked to Valerie about this a little bit, Valerie Dodd, who's the executive director. We really hope that once we start churning the cash, that we can return it back into the community by just dropping rates. I mean, I really see, you know, maybe we'd have an adjustment in a couple of years and maybe a couple of years after that, another adjustment. Um, you know, it, you still have to have the money to operate it and to, to expand it and to grow it. And uh, as we were talking earlier before everybody jumped on, if we could just keep the squirrels out of the network, we'd be good. We are <laughs> about 85% buried, 15% aerial, and they managed to move into that area that's the 15% aerial and they, they, they have hearty appetites for, uh, for fiber cable, so. Um, our report rate on fiber, I'll share a little bit from my past life on a copper network, copper, well, copper uh, fiber uh, hybrid kind of a network. We ran about 5% on a report rate. That's port rates uh, per, per uh, 100 lines per month. Um, with this network, we're less than 1%. We're right at 1%, a little uh, bit less. Report rate, meaning people call up and say, we can't get service or correct. We need you to roll a truck or something. Yep, that's correct. Okay, so five, it went from five percent per month yeah. to, and we're we're less a little bit less than one percent. It's 0.99, I think seven or something cool. like that. So, cool. we we uh, you know we have a very um, we we have a great we have a great staff. The technicians, I can't say enough about them, and and I think what makes them so great is they're homegrown. We have plumbers, we have concrete guys, we have oil field workers, and and they have been now with this network since its inception. And they are phenomenal. I would stack them up against any fiber splicers and, and, and technicians that, that are out there. So um, really, just really good, really good team of technicians that take care of customers. Uh, we get calls on uh, repair and we're usually out there that same day, if not the next day. We have very little that runs over 24 hours. Um, 
Dennis, thanks very much. I, I have one more question. Earlier, you said that you were running a surplus of four hundred thousand dollars a year. Or... That, that was that was this that was the uh, the, the total for well, the actuals for twenty twenty. Uh huh. And so, what it, what are you going to do with that four hundred thousand dollars? Um, we carried it over. Part of it is what we're going to use um, for building this phase seven, and then we're going to also have some uh, you know some capital improvement project money that we're going to use for that. But my bigger issue is like 2023, we're going to have 1.8 million that we're going to carry over as the projection. And then we go up to 2.6 and then 4 million in 2025. So once we get there, we'll, you know, we'll have a bigger problem on our hand if you can consider a surplus a problem, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly get it figured out. <laughs> can I ask, that is after you've made payments in lieu of taxes, right? I'm sort of presuming. That, 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 yeah, that's with the um, uh, loan repayment of almost $6 million a year. But also, I presume like, municipal electrics will often do a, a payment in lieu of taxes to the local government, which is sort of like a replacement for a property tax. It's often a voluntary um, payment. And I'm just, if you don't know what that is offhand, or I don't know, maybe Longmont might not do it, but most municipals do it in my experience. And I don't know the answer to that, but I can certainly okay. find out for you. Sorry. Um, so, uh, so thanks very, very much, Dennis. Uh, I uh, really appreciate your, um, your exposition and um, we're, we're jealous of your success and our marketing person said, sign me up and Judy, all you got to do is move to Longmont, pick up your house and put it on a flatbed, move it to Longmont, Colorado, and you can get that kind of service or you can help us get FalmouthNet going. There we well, go. After FalmouthNet, can we have a Barnstable net? Because I'm ready. <laughs> absolutely absolutely um, that's, that's what question, we're aiming for question for dennis and that is yes. are you what's your architecture is it active ethernet or gpon or gpon gpon we use all calyx gear yep and, and one of the mistakes we did make too um is you know digging the dirt's the expensive piece the glass is not and we did 144s and I'm kind of taking that out. I, I, we're doing anything we grow now. We're doing 288s, the feeds in and out of the, uh, the new huts that we're building, just so we have that additional capacity. Wow. OK, thanks. Any, any uh, immediate questions for Dennis? Otherwise, we will move to Peter Schultz, who's uh, um, spent his career <clears throat> at Corning on the applied <laughs> physics of fiber optic networks, erbium doping, and all that stuff that sounds slightly illegal to, to us hippies, but, um, but actually made fiber uh, into a better waveguide. Peter Schultz, are you ready to talk? Peter, um, had, um, after he left Corning, he was recruited or roped into helping the Virgin Islands build a fiber optic network. And that's probably where he can help us the most but of course uh, his corning connections are probably also valuable peter take it away tell us um, about virgin can Island. i share can you let me share the screen um yeah sure uh, let's see here um oh I mean, it's on security uh, hang on here I allow participants yes you're on okay Mm. Let's see. Now I got to go to my. There you go. Give me a minute. Having 10 minutes, I figured this is an easier way to do it. Very good. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, you gave the story approximately correctly. Actually, uh, <clears throat> I started working in fiber optics in the uh, late 1960s uh, as a scientist. I was the chemist here on the right with um, two physicists and the three of us together made the very first low loss fiber for communications. So this in 1968 really opened the door to the concept of a practical fiber for communications. We then um, continued to work on it 
1972, <clears throat> I um, came up with a composition called germanium silica glass, germanium doped silica glass, and a process here that we call the outside vapor deposition, where we basically deposited glass onto rods. <clears throat> and we ended up with a fiber with an extremely low loss, just a few dBs per kilometer. And all I can say is this is 1972, so it's rather archaic looking equipment. But literally today, every fiber made in the world is based on that composition and on this general process. Obviously, it's scaled up, automated, you name it, all the bells and whistles. But every fiber today, and there's billions of billions of uh, miles of fiber out there today, is based on this concept. So fast forward, um, in, 19, in 2001, I retired. I was running a very large US operation for a German company where we made some of the basic glass uh, used to make these fiber optics. And uh, I moved to the Virgin Islands, US Virgin Islands, and uh, quickly discovered that we had really crappy services, put it <laughs> I mean, it was copper wire and uh, pathetic. So <clears throat> in 2010, um, I think it was around 2010, 2015, the um, federal stimulus program came out and I um, talked to the governor of the Virgin Islands. I lived on this island of St. Thomas. There were three islands, St. Thomas, St. John and St. Croix, all owned by the US. They are located over here in this little red box, um, quite a ways away from the US. In fact, from here to Miami, it's a couple thousand miles and it's the same from there to New York. Um, so it's out there. But it was an interesting place because on this island, St. Croix, there, <clears throat> it was a landing point for undersea cables coming from the US and going down to South America. So there's actually on the end of this island, two cables, fiber cables coming in um, from the US. Um, so it gave us a place where we could connect our network with fiber out to the rest of the world. So I convinced the governor at the time that we should go for the federal stimulus money and he agreed and we did. And uh, we got the, we won a grant. We got federal funds of $110 million to build an all fiber open access middle mile network in the Virgin Islands. And that included a, <clears throat> a matching funds of $30 million from the uh, local government. So with $140 million, we were able to build out this network. Um, just the basics of it are shown here in yellow. Um, they're healing lo uh, loops, if you will, around the islands. Uh, and then this one on St. John. And we built undersea cables between the islands, two of them to each island. So that if one goes down, the other one will keep running. And we got an IRU with, at that time, called Global Crossing. They've changed names so many times I can't even <laughs> what it is. Um, one was for their cable, access to their cable to New York and the other one was to Miami. So this is a pretty good, strong, robust network, uh, all fiber. <clears throat> Building it was a lot of fun. There's a lot of rock on these islands. So we had to use machines like this to dig the ditch, big claws, um, and then drop conduit in there. And then we put in fiber. We put uh, cables in with about I think it was at least 288. Some of them were higher than that count because we figured the fiber is almost free, quite frankly, sadly to say. It, it's this piece of laying out the network that's expensive. So we ended up putting a lot of fiber in, a lot more than we needed, but we're happy that it was in there. And then <clears throat> in strategic locations around the islands, we connected this fiber to what we called fiber access points shown here where the fiber comes into the building and can be accessed by an internet service provider. So it's here that the service provider 
can then put in his network, the last mile, if you will, out to the homes and businesses and so forth. And we have these strategically located around all three islands. So that's how this network got laid out. And um, laying the undersea cable was also a lot of fun. <clears throat> this is a, just to show an example, a ship running this cable between the islands. Um, it's the same ship that's used to run the cable between the US and Europe or US and Japan, it doesn't matter. Our fiber cables were in here and uh, laid out. And you can see here from the ship, uh, some of that cable was brought ashore. Tremendous amount of time and effort went into getting the permits to allow us to do this. And uh, I also learned how to drive uh, a landing craft and <laughs> help install some of that fiber, which was a bit of fun. So we put this amount in and um, got the system up and running. And this was as of 2018. So the uh, grants were awarded 2010, started construction the next year, got this operational by 2015, could offer up to a gigabit of service up and down. We had 315 community anchor institutions that were connected. These were also paid for by the federal government. And it was really to get the schools, the, the uh, government offices, uh, library, hospitals, medical facilities, you name it, operating uh, and connected to this network. So we, it was basically the beginnings of funding to keep this network running as a business. We got 12 local ISPs who connected up to this thing at about 350 endpoints to provide service. Keep in mind, VINGN was a middle mile service provider. It was not, um, it was not a service provider to the end user. We provided the service to an ISP and they provided the service. So we depended on that. That's really operating with one arm tied behind your back, okay? Because you're really not in charge of your business. You've got to attract and encourage ISPs to want to hook up. There were two very large incumbent ISPs, and they absolutely ignored this network. Huh. They wanted to see it die. Right? This was, as far as they were concerned, competition. Um, and uh, that's not a surprise. I think that's happened all around the country um, when these things get built. And we've heard some of that story already tonight. Um, as of 2018, though, with these 12 new local ISPs, serving about 50,000 end users and an average of about 100 megabits per second up and down to each of them. Um, there are about 150,000 uh, residents in the Virgin Islands. So this was a pretty good take at the time. Uh, and at that point, Virgin Island, VINGN was profitable and self-sustaining, keeping in mind we had no debt to pay off, right? The network was built and basically free. So anything we got we could use towards operating the network. And uh, just about that time, we began to deploy a GPON and a little bit of last mile fiber. We were not allowed to build a last mile network, but we were working with some of the ISPs for them to do that. Um, one of those we did into uh, Here's an example. <clears throat> this was a condominium complex. It has 75 units. I happen to live here and uh, I was able to convince the community here that lives here that we should put in our own fiber network, bring fiber to every one of these units and connect it in to that VINGN network using the GPON uh, or, uh, setup and using a local ISP each of us were able to get service. So they agreed, we built it. And uh, this was the first of it going in. This happened to be my own condominium. <laughs> and uh, here's fiber being installed. It's the uh, fiber that um, is, it, they call it Invisalite. We use the OFS fiber. Um, Corning has the same thing. Basically, it's just put in along the ceiling or along the floor you can't see it. It's just a small fiber strand with uh, some silicone glue to tack, hook it in there. And then it comes around into, a, into your uh, local service box. 
And uh, this was the one in my condo when we turned it on. And this was the upload and download speeds that we had. That's the first residence in the Virgin Island to be hooked up to an all fiber network. It ran from my condo all the way to New York or Miami and wherever the hell it went from there, the rest of the world. So um, from that standpoint, it was success, a success. That was 2018. Now I come along to the next point, which is where my second hand got tied behind my back. When this fiber network was built, it um, was owned, is owned by the local government. Um, it acts as a semi-autonomous entity in the government. That is, it operates as a business, but it is really government owned. And as such, the chairman of the company is the acting governor at the time. So every four years, a new governor would step in and he could decide how he wants to run this thing or not run it. Mm. And we went through two governors who were great. The first one who supported the build out, the second one who supported the operation. And then just a few years ago, we got the third governor who happened to be an executive from one of those incumbent <laughs> ISPs. Um, and he has, Do we know the, which ISPs they were? I mean, are they common household names? No, these are all local island. Uh, I see. Okay. So it, it was called, the company is called VIA, V-I-Y-A. And uh, I have to say in the last couple of years, he has not, he's let it limp along, but he hasn't really been fully supportive of it. Hopefully in another, I think another year, there's going to be another election and maybe the next guy will support it. But it's very difficult with that kind of a business model. First, you're the middle mile. You can't provide service to the end user. Secondly, <clears throat> you're absolutely dependent on who your chairman is. And the chairman is a political individual. So um, it makes it very difficult to run something like this. But we did it. We got it built. We got it running. And uh, that's about as far as I can go. I've okay. not, not because of that, but I have moved. <laughs> from there. I now live in Connecticut, um, where I do not have fiber, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, I'm limping along as best I can, like the rest of you guys. And um, Well, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, and um, thanks for uh, reaching out. Peter came to Falmouth to, to attend his grandson's graduation and, um, and learned about FalmouthNet. And uh, thank you very much for, for uh, reaching out to us and sharing your expertise. And hopefully this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll circle back, but I wanna hear from uh, one more speaker. Uh, Joe Chamberlain is the citizen activist. I can't, uh, Joe, tell, tell us if you have a more official title, but you're certainly the citizen activist and one of the select board members described you as the godfather of the Milton fiber to the home effort, uh, community network effort. And so uh, Joe, help us understand what's going on in Milton, please. Yeah, sure. Um, Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I have to say that um, um, uh, I have to say, uh, say hello to uh, Christopher uh, Mitchell because uh, your website, uh, all your all all, the, all your work um, uh, uh, that you put into the website was absolutely instrumental to me. Um, so I'll just and I'll I'll try to put this in a nutshell. Four years into a nutshell, but back in 2017, um, um, uh, really for just being engaged civically, um, I'm friends with the the. the a guy on the select board uh, just mentioned uh, mentioned to me that the uh, Comcast franchise agreement was coming up for renewal. That's an interesting. That was an interesting thing to me. So I read the contract uh, and then came across um, the INET, um, the, the the institutional network. Um, I didn't care about cable. I, I really don't. Uh, uh, but when I when I read about that uh, this institutional network that that was the hook uh, that has started a four-year journey. 
for me. Uh, and, and then Milton, thankfully. Um, and so that started, and I, and I started doing the research. What is this institutional network? What's it used for? Um, what's it made of? I, I you know, kind of uh, uh, learning about um, uh, 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 coax and HDF and, and then fiber, of course. Um, and um, it was really just kind of a, 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 a whirlwind of information that, that uh, I went through that summer. Um, and um, again, one more shout out to, uh, to Chris's uh, uh, website. I mean, it was hugely important, hugely important to me, um, um, helping me find uh, um, just where to start, just really where to start. Um, and so from there, um, I went back to my friend, uh, uh, Mike Zulis is his name, the, the uh, select board um, fellow we're talking about here. And we, both of us, we went to the select board at the time we said, we really think we should rebuild our own fiber network to replace the, the INET. Um, uh, we don't need Comcast to do this. They're not even servicing the thing, you know? Um, and we were, what I discovered along the way was that Milton, Massachusetts was a bit of a dinosaur and that we were actually still using our INET. Um, all of our schools were using it, uh, first responders, all the town, um, uh, um, te telecommunication needs were were using this this INET. So that started the uh, that started it all. Uh, the, the 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 select board um, created a committee. Uh, I served on that committee, uh, and we uh, we did a lot of uh, a lot of research. Uh, talked to a lot of people. Cold called a lot of people across the country. Um, all I found was help all everywhere. Uh, it, was, it was such a great experience. <clears throat> um, both from um, consulting firms, firms, which will always answer the phone, um, but also, you know, people who worked for municipalities and, uh, and whatnot. Um, uh, oftentimes we would invite them as guests to, uh, to address our committee uh, to help us answer questions. Um, we essentially, uh, on that committee, we midwifed um, a cost and design report uh, to replace our institutional network. Um, it was done by CTC uh, Technologies after an RFP process. Um, and they gave us uh, a, what we call the high level um, design um, and also high level uh, uh, cost estimate. Um, and um, uh, our plan all along, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. That's kind of uh, that's kind of the uh, the nuts and bolts of what what, I, I did with, with a bunch of other people in the town um, to get to a point where we had our cost and design report to replace the INET. Um, and then it just kind of stopped. That was, two th that was January, 2019. Um, and uh, um, in that time, for about 18 months, it basically just gathered dust. Um, and uh, and the reason why I bring this up is to highlight the, the challenges of, of, of being a citizen volunteer, um, uh, you know, in a, in a system that's really, um, I, in my opinion, uh, municip municipalities, local governments are really hamstrung um, for a million reasons um, to do innovative things. Um, uh, um, and that has been a real challenge, it's like wrestling with a with a twelve foot, you know, uh, marshmallow. You know, it's just you put so much effort into it, um, and you you try to push and you try to cajole and you know, and it's very difficult. And I say that without any rancor or blame. It, it's just it is what it is. It, it was very hard uh, uh, to uh, kind of persevere, um, um, but uh, we did. And uh, we have now revived uh, our, our municipal broadband committee. Uh, it's been reconstituted. Um, and since that was all back in December and January, just this past December and January. Um, and uh, since that time, um, um, you know, we have, we have really pursued this aggressively, kind of what I was hoping we did back in 2018. Um, and so far where we are, and, and David mentioned this at the top of the uh, uh, Zoom call here, um, we had a town meeting. Um, we were a town meeting form of government, just like Falmouth, it sounds like. 
and um, we we passed our first of two votes uh, to establish the legal authority to own and operate a municipal uh, broadband network. Uh, Massachusetts known um, a bit anachronistically as a municipal light plant, um, uh, but it's a it's a it's I don't know if it's an absolutely necessary that we have a municipal light plant to do this because I know there are you know five hundred one c three you know roads uh, options out there too, um, but that was really heartening. That was really heartening. It, it passed with eighty nine percent at town meeting. Um, what and, did you do to get that kind of a landslide? I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I it. it one of the another challenge, you know, being the citizen activist is I wish I had, you know, a hundred grand to spend, you know, on, on marketing, you know, on getting the word out on all the million ways that, you know, it, it, it can be done, right? Um, um, I'd like to say uh, some of it was uh, uh, my efforts. Um, I created a website um, and published it back in, uh, finally, back in uh, December. Um, I. I produced a video um, kind of explaining it, uh, like a, an introduction to people who've never really had uh, a lot about broadband. Um, I pushed it as hard as I one person could. I had help. I'm not saying it was, it was just me, but, you know, um, and the word kind of leaked out. Um, and I also have to say that um, I, I am a town meeting member. Um, I am uh, pretty active in local politics. Um, I kind of quote unquote, no, you know, know a lot of people, people, you know, uh, town meeting is about 280 people. Um, so I got to think um, a lot of it was um, osmosis, maybe, you know, of uh, how, how people got word of it. But I'll tell you what my experience is uh, when I bring it up like, anecdotally, right? So talking to people, I have yet to hear one person in four years. And believe me, I'm the guy at the party who's boring people to death uh, talking about municipal broadband. Um, I have not heard one person say that that's a bad idea. And I'm talking to and wherever you fall on the uh, on the political spectrum. Um, uh, so you know if you're if you're kind of more uh, conservative leaning, um, uh, you know more kind of maybe more pro business leaning or, or that way, you know I I start talking about the monopoly. I start talking about you know how Comcast is just robbing us. You know, and uh, on on crappy technology, um, and they're just happy to sit on and extract rents from us for, for forever. People and say, "Yo, oh, we can we can own our own network, you know, and lower costs, and you know, potentially uh, get out from under that." Yes, you know, uh, to the other side of the spectrum of uh, a political spectrum of of. Um, so what I've learned is that there's uh, municipal broadband has a very wide appeal. I believe. Um, uh, to people, um, and then the more they learn about it, uh, I think the more uh, uh, they they like it. Um, I have run into. Um, with that said, I have run into there's a bit of a learning curve because um, people and I went through the exact same learning curve back in 2017. I had no real conception of well, how does this signal come into my house? You know, when I'm watching cable, and then I crash course and I and I learned it. Um, but people just conceptualizing, um, you know, have sometimes have a hard time just understanding what this is. Um, and so that's been, uh, I, I wouldn't say a challenge, if, if people are willing to listen, you know, people can, can get it. Um, but once you kind of break through uh, maybe a little bit of what is this thing, um, and maybe even break through a little bit of, uh, of, of people's political leanings one way or another, um, I have really found that this is just the the, the most win-win situation uh, that I that I could kind of think of in local government, local politics, except for Comcast. They don't win. <laughs> um, so um, uh, that's kind of what we've been we've been doing in a in a in a nutshell. Um, we have a huge challenge in, fr in front of us. Um, I was trying, I, I was hoping to re reserve about five minutes of my talk here to talk about what I'm afraid of. Um, and, you know, it's, oh, you're, you're pretty much at the end, but I'm curious, what are you afraid of? Wow, that went fast. Um, 
you know, uh, I, you know, I have a million questions listening to you guys, for, you know, for Peter and Christopher and just and, and, and Dennis. Um, uh, I'll tell you one of my biggest fear is the whole idea of open access. Um, can we make it work? Mm -hmm. Milton, Milton is a very weird town. We have a 3% commercial tax base. We basically have no businesses in town. Um, we do have a couple uh, significant anchor institutions. We have an acute care hospital. We have a, a, a liberal arts college. Um, so, you know, right now we're, we're thinking very hard on the, on the, about the Ammon model um, of, uh, you know, software defined network, uh, open access, um, you know, the whole we own the infrastructure uh, and the services are provided by third parties. I don't know if that's going to work. Uh, um, you know, so that's a big fear. Um, uh, I have my opinion, you know, I think it can work, um, but that's a huge fear for me uh, or for us. Um, the, uh, the other uh, fear I'll have, and I'll just leave it at this, is um, can you build a network and operate a network successfully on just with essentially just residential customers? You know, Dennis, they kind of touched on that uh, when, when he was talking about it um, uh, in his, uh, uh, in, when he was speaking, that, that's a real huge fear. And so I often, um, um, yeah, exactly. With enough of them, you can. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so that leads me to think, it, you know, how, if you own the, this kick-ass asset that's going to be, you know, working for the next 50 or 60 years, you know, there, I just, <laughs> there has to be other ways to generate revenue with this asset and not in a like we need to get rich sort of way but in a way to make it viable and make us a player you know to make us have so that we are the town is is at the table in the coming digital revolution i don't want our town to be steamrolled by verizon i don't want to be steamrolled by comcast i want to say oh whoa, whoa, whoa. we have a fiber network and we're at the table when we're talking about things that are coming down the pike at us. So, so, so by <laughs> it, at year 20 when, or 25, when you've paid off any debt you might have, and Dennis Pappas just told us that the OPEX is really low. The um, number of monthly calls is like one fifth or less than, than it is in a conventional cable or, or twisted pair network. Um, you know, pre, pretty much you've got a very skinny crew and you're still collecting revenues. It's still valuable to people to have, you know, 100, 100 symmetrical or gigabit symmetrical or 10 gigabit symmetrical. Um, and so uh, I, I'm not, you know, by... Once you build the thing, it seems like it's almost everything else is almost for free after that. And, and, I, and I think my hopes are um, down the road, and this is Dennis, by the way, is that we can take, you know, we, we do have, we've had folks coming in or talking about, you know, putting 5G down the corridor and Main Street and all that good stuff. You know, I do think that <clears throat> there's an opportunity to, if we take some hits on the revenue there that we make it up by having them write our network or they lease our network or... You know, that's why I'm trying to build additional capacity in there today. So that's a thing, because we were wondering about that. Like, it, we're such neophytes over here. Like, you know, we're like, come use our network. Yeah. You know, we're going to yeah. own it We're going to own yeah. That's one of the things that I'm going to fight for, you know, vociferously is to overbuild, because everybody has said that for four years, overbuild. Yep. So Every overbuild. antenna on a 5G network has got to be connected to fiber. Does yeah. that's certainly the way it's going to work. I yeah. think you know here's the problem: the size and the weight of the antennas. And we, you know, LPC owns all the all the power poles and stuff. I mean, we can provide power. We can provide the structure. Yeah, although we may have to change out some because of the weight up at that 16 foot level. And we can provide the fiber for it. So, like I said, if we and we even are building the new huts with extra space, so we can do co-location space in them. So. If we do, uh, you know, if they do come into the market, I think we can uh, we can partner with them and, and offset any revenue losses that we may uh, we may take because of the new competition. Right, uh, Joe. What what have your interactions with your select board and town administration been like so far? Was that question to me? Yes, please. Um, 
it, they've been absolutely positive from day one. Um, they really have. Um, so we, like uh, way back in 2017, we did our first presentation uh, to the select board. Um, all on my website, by the way. Uh, I should be better at promoting the, not that I'm making anything from it, but we present it to the select board. If we select, you know, we, we build the INET, our institutional network, our idea back in 2017, and we still have this idea, is that when we build the INET, it's a, it's a de facto middle mile. And so, uh, so that would be our backbone uh, with once we have that running, and then we can think about fiber to the, to fiber to the home. That, that was our presentation. It, you know, also, you know, fire, police, schools, yeah. you know, cost savings, the potential for cost savings. Um, so they've been on board uh, right from the get go. Hey, Bruff, do you have any thoughts on this? Bruff Turner is one of our advisors and he runs an ISP and he's been involved in uh, internet stuff from day one. What have you heard that that um, strikes I, you as as good? Yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't worry about an all residential base. Uh, we're adding a lot of commercial customers now, but we were uh, 90, 98% residential for the first six years, uh, delivering services at typically $40 and, and $60 a month. And uh, yeah, this I, I wouldn't worry about an all residential customer base. There, there will be other ways of, of generating revenue in, in commercial things at some point, but uh, uh, the business model ought to work on residential. And if what they of... say about attracting new jobs is, has any validity, pretty soon you'll have some uh, uh, big bandwidth, high tech uh, businesses wanting to jump onto your network. Maybe. I mean, I, I would just say that in my experience, you really need a gifted economic developers um, to make sure that you are gonna you are gonna achieve that. Um, there's a number of networks I could name. Monticello, Minnesota is one that springs to my head, but there's others where um, they may have seen over 10 years, one significant employer, 200 jobs move into town, which is important, but it's certainly not like businesses falling over themselves to relocate um, in the absence of some other um, incentives and things like that. Um, the uh, I've, I've seen business plans that are built purely on residential with a goal of the the business customers being gravy that just you know makes a, it all work better and i think if you can make it work on residence that's going to be you know good regarding the open access i just want to jump into that because peter made some good points and i feel like some of us are trying to get a sense of what this looks like and i, I think to some extent um Peter, I see you shaking your head. I think there are different areas in which open access is more likely or less likely to work. Um, I certainly think in an environment where you're in islands where there's not a history of, of building ISPs and things like that, it's probably the worst possible environment. I think the work that Ammon is putting forth and the more accurately the Am city of Ammon is, has done with the work of entry point networks, um, which Bruce Patterson, who had built Ammon, is now working for Entry Point to help other cities do this, um, is predicated on kind of two ideas with open access. One is um, A, uh, one A, um, the path is basically if there's something valuable that ISPs can contribute, we're going to create an opportunity and see what they can innovate. On the other hand, if there's not really an opportunity for differentiation, they're going to automate it. <laughs> and so I feel like that approach is kind of interesting in that, like, there's a bet that ISPs will actually provide something aside from just like internet access and answering your phone calls if something goes wrong, um, which are things that are more or less like utility type functions. And if they do do those things, then they have a platform in which they can do them and compete. But on the other hand, if they cannot do those things, then the software should be more or less doing a lot of the things an ISP does today. And, um, and then the ISPs kind of go away in that model. And I don't think, I think anyone who speaks with any certainty as to which way we're gonna go is probably foolish. Um, I think we're at a point in which it's very hard to predict what the next 10 years will bring in this space, um, if that kind of platform is widely available. Is it, is, is it analogous to like, you know, VHS Betamax 1978? Like if you, you know, that maybe that's the wrong analogy because of, 
apparently Betamax was better, but <laughs> but VHS won. Um, but is it like that stark? Do you think? No, I think it's more a question of um, is the future of these networks basically all um, just IP, or is it I mean internet protocol, or is it? Um, or are there ways that you can differentiate different services, whether that has to do with providing different characteristics for different types of services? And then even if that is the case, does that become so fantastically complicated that it just doesn't work? And like, we just like much like most of the products that we use today that just shut down and don't work. Um, so they're adding a lot of they want to turn every network into a data center that where you virtualized a ton of the things that are being done right now by specialized gear and basically allow programmers to do more interesting things. And the bets are basically around smart cities, um, telemedicine and smart and energy like grid type stuff and seeing whether or not those things um, if you can create additional value in the networks locally that you could not do on just like a Comcast network because you have IP. Um, so I, uh, Courtney Bird, our president, has his hand up and it, I want to just stop and introduce uh, the two board members who I couldn't introduce at the beginning because they weren't here. Art Gaylord is uh, the co-founder of Open Cape and um, has... Uh, kindly consented to join our board and he's totally invaluable he's the only guy in town who's ever built a one of these networks he helped build the middle mile open cape network and courtney bird is our president and he actually got the ball rolling on getting uh, uh, the idea of a, a community network going in the town of falmouth massachusetts and courtney you've got your hand up so go for it <clears throat> thank you, David, and thank you all for participating in this. I think this, is, uh, this has been uh, very educational, and I can certainly empathize with a lot of the experiences, uh, particularly, uh, Joe, your experience with Milton uh, it runs parallel to what we're, what we're doing and what we're experiencing, and um, so this was great. And we're at a stage, I mean, the, the questions, for example, of whether we have um, an open access network or, or not is one of the issues that we need as a, as a, as a community to, to determine. We are still in the process of looking into a, a, an operating model. Um, so the municipal light plant um, idea is something that uh, we need to consider, and um, just the selectmen the other night just recently uh, just voted to create a working group that includes members of the town as well as the Falmouth Net, and I'm hopeful that this is one of the things that this working group will will uh, discuss. Um, and, and then the question of open access. For me, um, What's we are at a stage where the next step for us, we had a feasibility study that demonstrated said that this was this was feasible as far as Falmouth. Uh, and the next step for us is to create um, or have done a, a detailed engineering design study of um, to, to get down the costs, nail down much as you did. Joe and Milton. And um, so one of the questions that's, that is very much in the forefront of our minds, and so Matt, perhaps you all can chime in on this, is that we have the uh, federal government recently um, uh, passed a relief act <clears throat> and uh, the town of Falmouth is um, eligible for three point uh, three point plus million dollars. And so the question is, can um, those funds be used to, to fund this um, engineering study? And there was a spirited debate in the selectmen's meeting on Monday. And um, so I wondered if um, uh, any of you had some insight on that. I can I can say that we're 
we're digging into that like crazy right now. So like we as a town, it, it, it's really, it's not just, can we use it for you? You, you uh, um, said to use it for the, uh, uh, the engineering study, you know, we're thinking about other uses, frankly, to build our institutional network, our INET. Um, so we're asking the same questions here, Courtney. Um, so cold, uh, cold comfort, not really any advice there, but, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're digging into it too. Matter of fact, me and David had a little back and forth on email today about it. Yeah, the, Chris just posted the, the treasury department's frequently asked questions on use of those stimulus funds. And it's a fascinating read, especially on the broadband part. It gives very wide discretion uh, to uh, um, applicants about uh, what, how they define reliability and how much, how many households can have 25 megabits down and three megabits up to, to actually to consider themselves underserved. It's pretty, it's really a, a very permissive document and um, it was a joy to read. So um, Chris, thanks for posting that. I, um, uh, Dan Gesson, Doug Brown, and Judy Crocker haven't said much, and I invite you if you have a, we're coming to the end of our hour and a half. If uh, Doug, we, anything to add, or Dan Gesson, yeah. Judy? I, I'll, I'll quickly add on the uh, funding. I think we're going to request the two hundred thousand from you know probably four sources, and whichever one comes in first, and uh, the rest can go in the kitty. As far as questions, I'd like to ask Peter Schultz about why with only 50,000 uh, 50, residential subscribers, do you need 12 ISPs? Is that just the, the lay of the land? Uh, it seems like a lot. Uh, you don't need 12, but at that stage, that's those are the new ones that cropped up. They, they didn't think really exist before that. They were just two. And those were what I call the incumbents. <clears throat> but when the incumbents did not embrace this new network, in fact, hope to see it die, these new folks came in. Most of them are undercapitalized. So they you know, go into a neighborhood or they go, um, one of them goes to hotels and connects hotels into this network so that they can provide services that way. So that's, that's why they cropped up like that. Okay. Added Oh, I think maybe three are going to be really survivors and keep the thing going. All right, thanks. Can um, I so uh, let me ask permission. It's now, we've now gone 90 minutes. Is it all right to go another 15 minutes? Okay. Anybody object? Feels okay with me. Okay. I don't object, but I have to 15. sign off and I'd be happy to answer anything over email if it comes up, David. Feel free to ping me. Oh, Chris, I have to thanks go very with my much Sorry. for, for Thank being you. part of this. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Bye everyone, it's great to hear the discussion. Okay, anyone who needs to go now, that's fine. We'll run another 15 minutes. Art, you had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to note that, you know, um, a lot of what Peter said was talking about was quite similar to Open Cape's experiences in building the middle mile in on the Cape in southeastern Massachusetts. And um, two differences of note are one, um, we didn't get the ISP response that uh, we had hoped to. Um, that there weren't people who jumped on board to want to take over the ISP responsibility. You know, part of that was the timing. I think the economic climate yeah. and so forth. Um, and the other thing that was that's different, and I'm sure glad that I fought for it, is that um, Open Cape is a independent nonprofit organization and not beholden to directly to the government. Um, our county really wanted to be, uh, be the uh, owners of it and the operators of it and people behind Open Cape fought against that and hearing from your experiences I'm sure glad we did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if I could just can I just come um, please a couple of things. I think you could have an open access network if you can eliminate the two <laughs> arms tied behind your back, right? One of them is that you, in, in the case of the VINGN network, they could not become an ISP. By law, they were not allowed to be an ISP themselves. They had to depend on 
others to just use your network. You were simply a transport network. But if you could take on both roles, be an ISP, but also be willing to let others use your network, I guess I would call that an open access network, I think that's the best of both worlds because it gives you at least a chance to take care of yourself if others don't step in and provide that kind of service. Um, and the second piece of that is the other arm behind your back was it was really the administration of this network was tied to politics. And the more you can keep the politics out of the game and the more you can call it a normal business and operate as a rational business, the better off you'll be. advice um judy dan comments questions um i would i've i've seen um some of dan's market uh, joe's marketing materials from milton i i saw the video that david was kind enough to send um our group i'd love to have a conversation with you joe about some of the techniques that you used um yes they 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 have a little bit more money for marketing maybe than than you did but we certainly don't have a hundred thousand dollars so um we are definitely trying to um work on a small budget and try to use a ground game and some other things to make that happen but i'd love to hear um what's been successful um for milton and talk to you directly about it so i think david can probably connect us i will facilitate that in fact um yeah. i'll make sure that I think everybody has everybody's email on the invitation, um, but I can set up a small mailing list for for us to, you know, sort of friends of FalmouthNet uh, to correspond with each other and share share ideas. I don't mind. Great. Okay. Um, anybody else have any uh, uh, closing comments or observations? Yeah, can I just make one, one quick comment, and it is uh, the fiber itself. The basic fiber is not going to change. So the construction of a fiber is what it is. And Do the, you agree that it's a, basically a 100-year asset? Oh, yeah. I mean, we have fiber out there today that was built, was put out on the poles 50 years ago and still working. And it, the, the fiber is hanging in there, so to speak. But the fiber price has come down, 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 down to where today the fiber itself is almost free. So I would say when you build a network, put way more fiber into it than you think you need because that would be helpful down the road. I know it will. The other pieces that's costing money, the part that costs the most money is either hanging it on the poles or trenching it in, and also the electronics that you have to finally put on the end of it, all the switches and stuff like that. But the fiber itself, it's almost like a no cost in the system. Doug? I'm just curious of other networks, and I should have asked this before uh, Mr. Mitchell left, but uh, how many uh, networks are using the 5G to deliver that last mile as what we discussed at our select board meeting on Monday that is one option that we haven't really deeply considered I'm wondering if that's something we should be thinking of or not. Well, 5G is wireless <laughs> technology, you know that, right? You need to ask Chris, but 5G, there's real 5G and it's really functioning. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of bandwidth. It can only run over a short distance, maybe uh, right. 50 yards or something like that. But all of the stuff that you need to stuff into it requires a lot of bandwidth. So every single one of those little antennas, whether it's on a telephone pole, on the side of a building or whatever, has got to have a fiber hooked into it. And a, you know, a disadvantage of it is that, you know, 5G will ultimately need to be upgraded the way the phone companies have been doing it. It's like short time frames, you know, five to 10 years. And plus all those antennas need power and so forth. And if you do something like um, a GPON network, which is what most people are building now, uh, all your electronics are concentrated in a few places, plus people's homes. And you, know, you can upgrade from one generation to the next. Like you can go from a gigabit to 10 to 25 to 100 without changing uh, anything except for your central electronics 
and what's in people's homes and you can do that home by home. And yep. that's a tremendous long-term advantage. Yep. Um, Judy. Correct me if I'm wrong, please, because I'm learning more about this technology. I'm much more familiar with radio technology, but 5G would be the same as using my cell phone. And uh, is that correct? Okay, yeah, so if that is correct, I can tell you that in the summertime, uh, I we cut the cord, we only have our cellular service in the house. In the summertime, I have the same problem that many of you folks have in Falmouth. My, the, you know, there's so many people here, I can't connect to people. I drop calls in my house on my cell phone which I never do off season. So I don't think that's really the long-term solution, especially here with the, the influx of people in the summertime. You wanna to try to do all your work on that 5G? <laughs> I think the answer is no, right? You still wanna have some kind of a computer, something in your home that you can function with. And that's going to be something through GPON where the fiber actually comes into your home, sorry. Well, thanks for that feedback. I appreciate okay. it. Uh, thanks, Dan, for, for participating. Uh, Courtney, you have a question? <clears throat> I just wanted to add to the 5G discussion. It's a short wave transmission. It's straight line. It's subject to a lot of interference. Um, and I don't believe the geology, the geography of Falmouth and the geology is suitable for it. It's just too much. And anybody who lives in Sipawissa uh, has a cell phone, knows what, how bad the service is, and you're going to get the same problem with 5G. So I think, you know, um, fiber to the home is the most reliable option we have for this town. The other thing is that, you know, 5G is, I mean, although it's possible to do a private version of it, the general, what's being talked about is being brought to you by the same companies that are not serving as well. <laughs> no. Right, exactly, the enemy. One more question. Uh, when the power goes out, my generator kicks on, will my fiber connection still be live? Yes. Yes, if you have your generator. Can't believe I didn't ask that sooner. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, one of the properties of a fiber optic network is that there's very few um, electronic midpoints between you and the internet. So there's fewer points of failure. And of course, if the power goes out there, they've got to have batteries or generators. But since there's, I mean, basically, if you shine a light in Woods Hole, um, uh, the equipment can detect it in Hatchville with no further amplification. Um, and uh, so it's a really uh, simple, network with very few electronics and um and so the idea that you can power the electronics is uh is stronger in, in the virgin first, islands we had uh, two very serious hurricanes back to back um and really devastated a lot of the islands yeah. and most of the stuff on poles got ripped off but because most of our core network is underground um, and we have those buildings I call FAPs, which were the basically central terminals. Um, those had battery and generator backup. That network was the only communication network that continued to operate throughout the storms. And so you could still, if you had access to that network, you could be talking to somebody in New York without any problem or wherever. And that's open Cape's experience too here with our hurricanes and nor'easters. Yeah, open Cape basically the the out you can get endpoint outages when the customers lose power and don't have generators and so forth, of course. Right. But um, even with people hitting poles and hurricanes and so forth, we're not the network is not going down because of that. In part, it's because we build redundancy in. Um, uh, but the other thing in a place like Falmouth. You know, this is something that the engineering design study will firm up, but we're probably talking about two to five locations in the town that would actually have to have power to keep the network up. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, Judy, the, um, we've been, the, 
there's a initially you come in and you think fiber optics means fast, but really what we're talking about here is fiber optics means reliability more than that. Um, so and so that would be a marketing message that I think would be really the primary message. Um, something like a uh, uh, 60 70 percent of the residents of Falmouth have experienced outages of more than a day in the last 12 months, according to the feasibility study. That's reliability. So um, I think that's really the strong one to hit. Okay, final closing comments. Oh, go, Judy, you're on mute. Come, come back. I'm back. I just want to, Doug, when you brought up 5G, the one thing, if you remember that nor'easter where people who had Verizon cellular service had cell service and people who had AT&T did not. Right. You know, and the I cellular had, networks here on the Cape aren't that reliable either. And I had just talked my wife into getting rid of Verizon and going on my AT&T. <laughs> it was a real problem. Yeah, it was. We were fortunate to have Verizon, but my but husband's did, parents I, didn't, so we kept but I did get a, bills. But I did get a $47 rebate for all my troubles so that week. <laughs> and that's just the luck of the draw. It could have been Verizon that went down and not at and Right. But AT&T service, so I've had the same service since 1987 or eight when I had the bag phone. It was cellular one and whoever bought them out, now it's AT&T. And uh, the service is worse now than it was in the 80s and 90s. You know, it just seems like it's getting worse and worse. Because there's more people on it. Yeah. Joe, I mean, you I had, had a great comment? Verizon service in 94 when I got my first phone too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Joe? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I wanted to mention something that um, I wasn't able to shoehorn in on my on my uh, on my talk earlier, um, and that um, is uh, the uh, the Leverett model, Leverett, Massachusetts, um, of of the corporate you know the the corporate structure, if you will, and relationships that they built in order to get it in order to get their thing running. And David, I think me and you talked a little bit about this last week. Um, but I do want to mention with all the municipal folks on the, on the call here, um, it's a fascinating model and they're making it work. And, and, and what the most salient thing that, I, that I'm talking about here is um, they basically were able to execute intra-governmental contracts between Leverett, the municipality, and I think it's uh, Chicopee. Holyoke. Yeah, Holyoke, thank you. Um, you know, and Holyoke operates their network, right? And they, they have the trucks, they have the, they have the, uh, the technicians. Um, but we were told by the Leverett folks that, um, that there are very significant advantages to going that route um, when it comes to procurement, uh, you know, the you know, uh, procurement laws um, that um, um, are not, it's not as stringent, I guess. I, I'm, try, I'm trying to pick my words here carefully because I'm not an expert. But, but the intergovernmental uh, uh, contracting aspect was a huge uh, help to, to to make that whole thing work. Yeah, Joe, I've written. I've uh, thank you very much for introducing me to Peter Dorico of Leverett. I spoke to him. He introduced me to some other people. I spoke to them, and now I ha actually have a working draft of a, of a um, report on um, the advantages and drawbacks of becoming a, a municipal light plant. Thanks to your um, uh, initial connection making. Uh, and, and I'll be happy to share that draft with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I, quite frankly, that's the only way we can, we think we can do it. I mean, we're not going to, we can't buy, you know, you know, four bucket trucks and, you know, and hire people, you know, so, but that's nice to hear. Thank you. Thanks for that feedback, David. Okay. Uh, Braintree so, has a very robust light company. And, you know, I have a friend in Braintree who every time the power goes up on the Cape sends me a text message about Braintree power and lights going strong. So, uh, yeah. you know, that's not that far away from from Milton, maybe there's an opportunity there. I don't know. Well, the the um, municipal networking movement is actually 
uh, inherited a lot of its mojo from the municipal electric, the public power movement of the 1920s. Um, now about 15% of all the electricity generated in this country is done by municipal city owned or community owned electric plants. And we think there's a direct parallel uh, from that to municipal uh, internet access networks. Absolutely. May I throw a final point in from my side? VINGN does not own a single bucket truck. All of that work is done uh, through contracts with uh -huh. providers. Uh -huh. You can simply have a, a nice contract in place that they'll show up at a certain period of time when you have a problem and take care of it for you. What you really do want to do is have some people in your own organization that know how to splice. And you need to have a couple of splicers and a little splice truck because if there's a break or you're adding a new customer, you want to take care of that yourself. Can I, can I just jump in on that, Peter, really quick? Uh, and this might be a little bit for the problem with people. You know, we have a technical high school, uh, regional technical high school here, uh, uh, Google's uh, Tech. I thought it was a great idea that if we had this thing, that we start talking to them and say, you know, try to work out some sort of training program, you know, uh, and internships and things like that. <laughs> that, you know, some community engagement, you're getting something good out of it. Maybe they'll, and maybe they'll stick around and be your splicers of the future, you know? Today, yeah. Judy sent me a, a ad uh, for Cape Cod Community College, uh, uh, their fiber optic technician training program. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. It's happening. Yeah, they, they, they do it. And also the upper Cape technical high school in, uh, uh, in Bourne where I'm on the, their IT group advisory committee, uh, does fiber training as well. Very good. The same level as four C's, but, and, uh, open Cape, by the way, does not own any trucks either. <laughs> uh, is there any, um, is there anything that Cape Light Compact could do for us on the county level with, uh, I don't know what kind of operation they have. I know they do uh, energy retrofits, but do they actually participate in the electrical network management at all? I don't no. understand. No? No. They just have the uh, dollars, huh? They, they have just... the dollars. They do, some, they do a little bit of monitoring, but they don't do any direct, any direct services. Okay, thanks. But it That's is true that in, Chattano in Chattanooga, um, they, the electric, the municipal electric plant, um, decided they would put a fiber to every electric meter in town, regardless of whether that household took internet service, because, um, if they had a direct way of monitoring every electrical customer, they could, um, automatically detect and restore about 60% of their electrical faults and they could locate the rest of them as opposed to the normal method of having a truck drive up and down the street to see which houses had power and which didn't. They could detect electrical theft. And with those three things, they could make their business case for putting fiber to every home without internet access being considered at all hmm. so i i would love to partner with eversource but they're they're a kind of an you know they're a stodgy old investor owned utility and probably wouldn't partner with us but falmouth could become kind of a showcase for for smart grid type activities if if uh we found the right person at Eversource to advocate. But I can I can help you with that. A good close friend of mine was the uh, vice president of government relations at Eversource, and he still has many contacts in upper level management. Oh and, please, oh please. And he has a summer home on the Cape. So oh, please, oh please. He needs can do, that. I can help with. <laughs> Excellent. That would be great. Okay, so let me say, um, it's been a great, uh, well, should we go on another? I mean, this is lively. Let's it's go on. Past okay. my bedtime. <laughs> yeah, I, I see you looking at your watch. Okay, 10 more minutes. We'll stop at nine. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to drop off at this point, but okay, uh, thanks, this Rob. was very, very good. Yes, okay. Part really. of the problem with dealing with Eversource and, you know, 
Open Cape did a lot of stuff with them when we were building and still tries to do stuff. In fact, they own fiber on or they have access to fiber on our network that they use for monitoring is uh, the Massachusetts laws concerning tariffs and how things are, are regulated and so forth uh, tend to work against um, such sort of special arrangements like that. And so you would need some, I think you would need some legislative or at least the state administration help to get some of this passed to, to work. At least that's what the, you know, the ever so many people that, that I've talked to at the VP level have been telling us for years. Oh, wow. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, <laughs> sounds like we've uh, sort of talked this one out, or at least for this evening. I will put together uh, a mailing list and we can keep talking. And who knows where it'll lead. Joe Chamberlain and I are talking about an Eastern Massachusetts Community Broadband Summit. Um, I did have some correspondence with the executive director of Open Cape Art, and uh, he's going to get with his executive committee in case you know anyone on the executive committee. Like uh, me. <laughs> But I'm talking um, to him about that tomorrow. Yeah, okay. Well, um, suffice it to say, uh, let's keep talking. Let's keep learning from each other. Thank you all very, very much for your time. I feel so honored to have been part of this conversation. Peter, I just thanks want to for say you. Thank, thank you for inviting me and uh, happy to be able to hopefully give you some information that will be useful as you go forward. And I wish you well with it. Peter, very remind helpful. me where in Connecticut you are. I'm in Madison, Connecticut. Which oh, Madison. Is, okay, uh, right. Halfway up the shore, not too right. far from uh, New London. Halfway between New London and New Haven. Right. Very good. Well, thanks for sharing your experience, and okay. thanks for your work at Corning early on. I sure appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, everyone, for being part of this uh, good discussion, and um, it was I learned a lot. And um, thank you all for being a part of it. And, and a good Art, page of and, notes here, so yeah, thanks. Yeah. Art and Courtney, this has been recorded and um, you know, I trust we have your consent under Massachusetts two parties. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. very good. Okay, just get that on. Thank you. I've okay. learned a lot. Good Thank night, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Nice to meet you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Doug.